Good evening and a very warm welcome. A housekeeping detail first. There are no fire alarms in this uh, building. In the case of fire, please follow guidelines from the SOAS staff who will be here to escort you out. My name is Somnath Batabial, and I teach here at SOAS at the School of Glo Global Media and Communications. And I cannot be more pleased to see you all here and announce the launch of a new Masters in Global Journalism at, and so as a partnership with the Institute for Journalism and Social Change. This evening we have a very distinguished panel to talk about the profession of journalism and the crisis it finds itself in today. I will introduce the panel shortly. But I would like to focus briefly on why we felt it was imperative that SOAS, where our primary work is on the global south, and no doubt we are a research and theory-focused institution to turn our sights on practice, here, journalism. While journalism has always had to adapt to new threats, mainly technological progress, be it radio, television, or new media, the present threat to the profession seems to be from multiple quarters and all at once. What we considered politically free media is now tied to corporate interests. Clicks determine worth of a story. Some would argue that the profession itself is unnecessary, with politicians, starting with Al Gore in 2000, directly reaching their audience. The gatekeeping of journalism today might seem redundant to more and more of us who use multiple means of produc production available to reach our focus groups. At SOAS, where we are committed to democracy and fairness and justice, the threat to journalism means a threat to all that we stand for as an institution. It was as imperative that we wanted to engage with the practice of journalism. We wanted experienced journalists, both in the global north and global south, to teach our students. And we wanted our students to benefit from the rigorous theoretical lens our academics throw on practice. By bringing in practitioners together with SOAS scholars, we hope to create and deliver a program that ultimately each year will produce not only good journalists, competent in their trade, but conscientious journalists who know that they're writing not only the first draft of history, but also defending democracy, fairness, and justice. Now to absent friends. Professor Annabel Srebeni was the co-founder of the Center for Global Media at SOAS. It was Annabel who introduced me to Professor Justin Klosberg on behalf of a new organization, the, institution, the Institute for Journalism and Social Change, which was looking to partner with a leading university to deliver a world-class MA program in journalism. Annabel is no longer with us, but she would be very delighted this evening. In her honor and in recognition of Annabelle's unrivaled contribution to the field of global media and activism, it is my pleasure to announce the launch of the Annabelle Srebeni Journalism Prize. This prize will be awarded to one student each year who makes the most outstanding contribution to the role of journalism in preserving and promoting freedom of expression, human rights, and democracy. A very special thanks also to the Frontline Club which has co-hosted tonight's event, an organization that has long been a champion of independent journalism and which has literally provided sanctuary for journalists under attack. Truly, nowhere in the UK could you find a better panel to discuss journalism and the unique threats the profession faces today. I'm delighted to welcome Yasmin Alibai Brown, Peter Roburn, and Alan Rusbridger. Alan Rusbridger is well known to us as the former editor-in-chief of The Guardian. And Alan, since the year 2000, when I first came to the UK, Guardian is the first paper I open every morning. You revolutionized how we will forever read and consume news with your focus on the digital space and how Guardian was going to reach its readers. You stood down in 2015 and took up the position of principal of Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, 
and you're currently the editor of Prospect and chair of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Very big welcome to you. From 2010 to 2015, Peter Oban was a chief political commentator of the Daily Telegraph. He was awarded the columnist of the year press award in 2012 and then again in 2016. You only have to read his column on why he resigned from the Daily Telegraph. You'll find it in the Open Democracy website to understand what is wrong with media in democratic countries in the first world. He's the author of several books, including The Assault on Truth, Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, and The Emergence of a New Moral Barbarism. Peter, you and I share a passion for the game of cricket. <laughs> Wounded Tigers, your book on Pakistan and the rise of Pakistani cricket is without doubt one of the finest political treaties written. I hope you'll sign a copy of the book for me. I have one in my bag. <laughs> a very, very warm welcome to you. Yasmin Alibai Brown, you're my favorite columnist. I paid him. <laughs> you overcome the limitations imposed by the left, right, and the center, and write effortlessly for the independent as well as the express. Oh, no, no, no. No. The independent sacked me, and I hate the express. But you have oh, written. Oh, my God. Oh, but my you've, God. you've written for both of them. I was. Yes. Sacked me. Um, no, I write for I. I was going to come to that. Uh, no express, never written for the express. <laughs> that was bad research on my pride. Well, we started with the New Statesman in the 1980s, but you have also written for The Guardian, The Observer, New York Times, Time Magazine, <laughs> Newsweek, <laughs> The Daily Mail. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I got the right-wing paper in. <laughs> You were awarded the Media Personality of the Year in 2000. In 2001, you were appointed a member of the Order of the British Empire for services to journalism. In 2003, you returned the award. While I have read you for decades, not in the Express, Yasmin, I've seen your wonderful performance in the tales of the extravagant stranger. One of my favorite memories of you is to sit across at the British Library Cafe and discuss writers from South Asia whom we like and whom we do not like. A very warm welcome to you. It was imperative that we involve practitioners to deliver a master's focused on practice. But it was a new and novel partnership for an institution that has very established ways and thoughts on pedagogy. We would not be here this evening but for the full and wholehearted support from Professor Adam Habib, Director SOAS. The very first time that I took this proposal to Adam and explained what I wanted to do, his immediate reaction was, OK, how do we do this? I'm delighted, therefore, that Adam is here with us this evening, and may I invite him to the lectern. Uh, so, Sonna, thank you very much, friends, colleagues. Thank you for coming. I'm supposed to do a couple of things at these kind of events. I do quite a few of them, as you can imagine. And normally I'm meant to say a few words, uh, which are really about marketing, about how great we are, what a great institution we are, what is our mission. I'm not going to do all of And then I'm meant to uh, say a few things about the thematic issue on the panel. And often, the person who's organized the conference then writes a, a briefing note for me to say, here's what you should say so you don't embarrass us. Uh, so I'm going to say two things. First, to welcome you all at SOAS. It's really lovely having all of you here. And please do uh, come back often, because this, this place is meant to be a place uh, where people come, where people engage in deliberation and reflect on the issues. There are two fundamental elements of the SOAS mandate that I think speaks to the institute that we are launching today. And the first is our, uh, our purpose in serving as an intellectual bridge. Obviously, at the level of geography, so we're located in the heart of London, 
but our mandate is the majoritarian world. And we meant to serve as an intellectual bridge that introduces ideas into the West from the majoritarian world and enables those ideas to go back. So that's the first fundamental purpose of it. But also, it is meant to be a place where we introduce alternative voices, voices that are not often heard in the academy, voices that are not expressed. And so, in a sense, when you're launching an institute like this, it speaks to that fundamental mandate. The second is a couple of months ago, we were confronted with an enormous challenges that were playing out in universities, both in the UK and the US. And the universities took a position in most parts of the US and frankly the UK that we are neutral. And we took a position as SOAS that we're not neutral, that we have uh, a socially grounded mission. And that actually we argued that no institution can claim to be neutral. Uh, what you can claim to be is a commitment to plurality. But plurality is not neutrality. And there needs to be a significant reflection on this. And it seems to me that at the heart of this project is a desire to reflect multiple voices, to inform, to have informative deliberation, to provide and train a group of people that, that speak to that, but not to create a false neutrality. Because in many ways, when one claims a neutrality, as Desmond Tutu said, uh, you actually take a side. And that's something that we shouldn't forget. <laughs> and then I want to say something about the theme, theme of today. And, and that, in, in essence, touches on what Sobna touched on. And that is that we live in an incredibly polarized world. The, if there is anything that defines us today, it's the extreme deep polarities of our world. And there are structural elements to that, the inequalities, economic inequalities in our societies. But part of that deep polarity, at the heart of that deep polarity, is the question of misinformation. And misinformation is driven by the privatization of information and the desire to get clicks and the desire to get clicks by tapping into the most vulnerable elements of the human psyche, that of fear and that of hate. Because when you touch in and you click on fear and hate, you get people reading and then you get advertising and on the basis of that, you create and enable the very, very deep polarities. Our society, our world, is under huge significant threat. We don't have, we've not had inequalities at, like this. At the last time we had inequalities that we have today was around 1913, just before the, the world went through two world wars. The kinds of language, the kinds of behavior we see today is reminiscent of what we saw close to a century ago. But what it also requires, I want to add, is a fundamental shift in behavior by those who see themselves as committed to a cosmopolitan progressive project. We can't behave like the right, even if we use rhetoric that is different. Because if we don't behave differently from the right, we are then become the right. And that's something that I think requires a deep, deep reflection amongst all of us in how we think through those issues. And for me, what this project is about is speak, speaks to that social mission. Because if this training is correct, if it does happen, if we do train a generation of journalists that can speak to this moment in addressing those deep polarities, in addressing that misinformation, but in also asking us how do we behave differently from how those that we, we are concerned about, then 
we're beginning to ask what are the fundamental issues of our time. The second is, and this is fundamentally different, universities have to go through a reimagination. We can't be what we were 50 years ago or even what we were 30 years ago. And part of that is about what we teach, part of that is about technology. In fact, a lot of it has to be about how we teach. And part of that is about technology, but part of it is how do we inform learning, not by those who've simply taught, who've studied, that is important, academic training is important, but what is also important is learning from those who have done. Those who've grappled with the daily, daily craft of journalism itself. And in that sense, we're breaching boundaries. Universities have kept very rigid boundaries around themselves to protect the art of training to those who've got PhDs. Now, as somebody who's got one and as somebody who leads an institution where all of the people are required to have one, those PhDs are important but we also need to open up a conversation on how we train, who's let into the classroom, and how do we learn from experience as much as from what we've studied. And in that sense, this institute speaks to that. And so we are particularly excited that this institute has been launched, that we have the kinds of colleagues on the panel that we have, and this is part of an ongoing innovation, if you like, an intellectual innovation on how we reimagine ourselves for, and make ourselves fit for purpose as an institution for the challenges of our time. So again, welcome to this event. Welcome to SOAS. And please don't be strangers. Come many, many more times. Thank you very, very much. Right now, I'll transform myself into the chair for this panel. Um, how we will do this, and I'll be strict about timing and the questions that I take. Uh, should we do about between five and 10 minutes from each speaker on the subject and then see what conversation emerges? I'll let you good folks decide the order. Who wants to go first? Second and third. Happy to go first. Peter. What do I do with this? This machine. Uh, you just switch it on. That, that, it's on, I think. It's on. It's on. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, th thank you very much. It's a great honour uh, to be here, and, and I think we can agree um, that there is a, a crisis in journalism, um, and I think that the, the, it is the assault on journalism we're talking about. In that case, I think we should start off by acknowledging that... Um, Journalists are being attacked, murdered, killed on a scale we've never seen before in Gaza and in Lebanon. Uh, I, there's an interesting background noise which is slightly putting me off. What is it? Good God. <laughs> I might be responsible for it. Yeah. <laughs> I apologise. Um, but uh, it's uh, more uh, journalists have been killed, I think I'm right in saying, than in, the entire, in Gaza than in the entire Second World War, in the, the Vietnam War, um, and uh, in any other conflict. It is, uh, and there's no question that they're being targeted, and not just them personally, their families are being targeted. If, you, if they're giving their... Uh, locations to the Israelis, it seems that they're likely to be targeted at the locations they gave to the Israelis. That seems to be the case that happened a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is a, the most terrible, um, terrible time in history for journalists. And of course, the thing at Middle East Eye, which I work for, we have a number of uh, journalists in Gaza and in the West Bank. But in Gaza, it's, I, don't, uh, I, I know very well the person who ha looks after them and manages them and, uh, and gets that copy. I mean, the, the, their life is 
getting filing is the least of their problems. They have to wake up in the morning and wonder how they're going to get a glass of water. They have to find somewhere to sleep. I mean, they have all the problems in common with the remainder of the population in Gaza. Uh, and as well as the fact that people, are, uh, to begin with, I mean, they, uh, because they are likely to be targeted, people aren't very keen necessarily to be anywhere near them. I mean, it is, uh, it is just, uh, but they, they are, have brought to us the truth of what is happening there. These extraordinary testimony, the, cat, the photographs, the evidence of one war crime and atrocity after another. And uh, we should honour those people today above everybody else, so the best of the best of us. It brings us on to the second part of my, our discussion. That plight is ignored by mainstream British journalists. The fact that there is a slaughter of journalists in order that the truth should not be told about is what is happening in Gaza is a matter of total indifference to the Daily Telegraph, the Times, the Murdoch Press, the Associated Newspapers, the Express Newspapers. They couldn't, they, these papers, and I've worked for all of them apart from the Murdoch Press, claim to be interested in a free speech. If they say that's and if a British journalist, which happens very rarely, is killed in a war zone, they go, they go on and on about it for ages, and there are sort of awards set up in their honour, and look, it is disgusting, the attitude of British journalists, mainstream British journalists, to the courage, heroism, and, uh, and sacrifice of the journalists who are, who are inside Gaza. And the next thing we need to mention is that journalists who write about Palestine in Britain are now being targeted. Not in the same way. Matt Kennard, Asa Wynn Stanley, and people like them, they're still alive. They're just getting interrogated by the authorities. And we need to ask why that is, because there is something in common which unites them. They write about Palestine uh, in a way which is very... Uh, critical of the government. And once again, total indifference from the mainstream British media about the fact that their colleagues are being interrogated interrogated in this way. Some of them, have, by the way, have, have, have lost their jobs. Sangeet, you know, Bella, Donna, uh, 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 Bella and, uh, uh, and Sangeeta. Just for, just for, you know, you're not allowed to... It's not as bad the situation in the States, but something... I, I, I think before we move on to any other kind of discussion here, we need to deal, we need to be aware uh, of what has happened to journalism, and not just journalism, we're well aware the same things are happening in the academic world uh, as well. I mean, Avi Schleim is the greatest historian of, of, um, of, of Israel since... He's never allowed... He's not allowed out. You know, he, was going to, he went to speak at Liverpool Journalism, but he couldn't. This is... Jewish scholar of, of, of Israel, but he's not allowed out because only certain voices can be... Ilan Pape has to deal with the same thing. We actually, they, the two great scholars of his modern Israel live in our country and they're not allowed out on uh, mainstream media. It's quite extraordinary, actually. It is just a sort of... Uh, it is part of a crisis in, um, in our democracy and our public, and our public discourse. Um, I, um, there's, I, I, and you cannot get, you cannot find out in mainstream media what, it, with one or two recent exceptions, what is happening in Gaza. Lebanon is slightly different, um, and the West Bank. You cannot find it out, or in the British government. Um, there have been two outstanding films which tell the truth about what has happened, both on Al Jazeera, which has also done the bulk of the best reporting, um, that is Gaza. It was about the Octo October the seventh. That was, f which told it didn't in any way cha deny or challenge the awful atro atrocities which were committed on October the seventh, but it told a much fuller story, including the atrocity propaganda which emerged out of out of Israel at that time and was repeated endlessly in the British papers, which are in fact a strategic weapon for the Israeli state at the moment the mainstream British papers, not covered anywhere. No mention, matters of revelations of deep 
significance of anybody wanting to understand the conflict, not covered anywhere at all. And then more recently, Richard Sanders, the producer, produced another film just called Gaza, a fascinating film which told the la- story of the last year through the eyes of these TikToking soldiers, tell- telling the world about their atrocities and how proud they were of them. And again, not it was sent out of every paper in Britain for review, not a mention from any mainstream paper or journalist or media organisation of any kind. That is the world we currently live in. I could talk beyond Gaza, but because we are going through a series of atrocities daily and hourly at the moment in Gaza, which are, do you read about them in the British papers? Of course you do not. Uh, And this is, uh, is, uh, I feel, uh, uh, this is, (laughs) it's very hard uh, to move on. Uh, and uh, I've probably used my five to ten. No, seven. you have more. more much well, I, I mean, the only other, just very briefly, I just move on to the other issues, which this is an issue which we have now entered into, a world we are now entered into, where I don't think it is possible to practice journalism of the sort which Alan Rusbridger masterminded so well at the, historically at the, at the Guardian when you were editor and Nick Davies. Did that, and others did those extraordinary investigations requiring enormous time and money to expose injustice. This, is, this doesn't happen anymore. The, the major groups are owned by offshore billionaires who do not, who, who, and, and uh, we're now seeing another, fra- another generation of this as the Observer goes up for sale, the Telegraph goes up for sale. And that these papers should not be seen any more as vehicles for truth or holding power to account. These are vehicles for, for, for a, an oligarchical regime to, tell, to, to create fabrications and stories which suit their interests. There are two types of press in Britain. There's what you might call the oligarchical press. That would be the Murdoch group, the Telegraph group and I dare say the Express Group, and, uh, and I'm leaving one out at the moment. I'm stretching for it, the Mail Group. And, uh, and then you have the corporate media, which is the Guardian Group. Um, and you don't have a... There is a complete gap in the entire newspaper horizon for, 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 the, left, for the left, for the trade unions, nothing representing them. Uh, so maybe the best would be the Mirror, but I think I don't see that happening there either. Uh, and uh, and uh, this, this is a crisis. It is a crisis in ownership. If you want to be, my final observe, observation, if you want to be a journalist, and it wasn't the case when the three of us went into journalism 50 years, an awful long time ago, uh, you, we, we, we all had quite, I was quite well paid for a while, uh, and, and I was able to live a, a sort of comfortable middle-class lifestyle. Nowadays, a journalist who goes into British journalism and wants to tell the truth, you can't. The only way you can do it is by realising that you have become a vocation. You're sort of a gentleman scholar earning about maximum of £20,000 a year, and there are very, very good outlets, Open Democracy, Middle East, I, Alan's turned prospect into a remarkable uh, outlet, and I, and I could name declassified, but they, these are all completely uh, outside the mainstream. Uh, Electronic Intifada has been doing very good work, but not, the mainstream ju- of journalism is, is just not available if you want to tell the truth. Thank you, Peter. You've been lucky. You've earned a lot of money. I spend my entire life earning very little, but being very content, actually, because I think it's a, a privilege. And it's also, I mean, you know, I, I think Peter Oborn is, is the most remarkable observer and brave voice in our country. And I'll never forget the day he called us BBC Rising Star, a client journalist, which no, on his own, on his programme. So, you know, I salute Amal you. Amal Rajan didn't like that very much, did he? No. <laughs> I also, but, <laughs> however, I think it is important to not 
give up really on, on, on the British press. And I'll come back to that because there are people and there are still papers and outlets in the mainstream media where, you, you know, Nasreen Malik writing the stuff she does for The Guardian yeah, yeah. is astonishing. Patrick Coburn writing in I. I write on and on about um, uh, Palestine and we are not stopped but there are other, we are punished in other ways, and I'll come to that. But I just want to run very quickly. I see this as a, a, a broader problem. I think we can talk about government oppression, and Peter's talked about some of the other forces. We can talk about prisoners, deaths. I mean, I always think, look, look how we remember Marie Colvin the uh, Sunday Times um, war correspondent who was killed in Syria. And look how we have never remembered Shirin Abukela, who was the most remarkable Al Jazeera journalist of her generation. She was wearing a press vest when they gunned her down. And um, it's always very interesting when you go to the press awards, who is remembered and who is not. But I'll leave it leave that hanging in the air. So we know that, and it, we, it, it's quite correct to point out that journalists are threatened everywhere. Turkey, Sudan, Uganda, where I was born and raised, the United States, um, everywhere. And many are afraid to write and speak anymore. But for me, the most depressing um, Example, um, uh, the Reporters Without Borders, Reporters Sans Frontier, does an annual report on freedom of the press around the world. Do look at it. It's got all the countries there where they are in the list. India was, after independence, committed to absolutely, uh, you know, the democratic model and a free press. And for decades, it had a free press. It is now totally unfree as far as uh, the media is concerned. Um, journalists have been beaten up. Their houses have been set on fire. I am banned. I am banned from India um, for, for such trivial reasons that it really makes you think. I'm banned because, three reasons, uh, I didn't tell them my father was born in Pakistan. My father was born in 1902 in Karachi. It was 40, more than 40 years before there was a Pakistan. They didn't want to hear that. I was being impertinent, I was told. But most importantly, I took a tourist visa when I'm a journalist, when I went on holiday, and I chaired an event about the uh, woman who was raped to death in Delhi. So I'm banned. Now, this India is, a, this is such a new and un, unexpected thing. So I'm just saying that even countries which had a tradition, quite embedded tradition, of a free press, get a certain kind of leader, and it soon crumbles. I also think that the, the West has been kind of... Um, forgive the word, masturbating on its democracy and freedom for a very, very long time. And now we see it for what it is. We see with Gaza as a primary example, but not only Gaza. You know, I heard, I heard Rachel Reeves today saying, I commit billions of pounds, these may not, maybe, may not be her exact words, to Ukraine, however long it takes, Ukraine shall have all the money it needs. Not one word about the weapons we're sending to Israel. And around, you know, around the world, when people used to think this was where the democracy was, where free press was, increasingly foreign students, I'm a part-time professor, a teaching professor, are totally disillusioned with the West and the lies it told about itself. For a while it was true. It hasn't been true for a long time. So I want to put that on the table. And a couple of other, do have a look at this uh, report. It's got fantastic. Um, but I fear that we also need, I, I, I believe we need to be looking at other things that are going on. 
Uh, Peter's mentioned the the ownership, the oligarchs, and the um, uh, billionaires, but there's also there are other pressures and oppressions that are happening, and we don't talk about those enough. It's like we are eating ourselves internally as a profession as much as are being beaten down externally. And unless we develop some kind of resilience and strength and fight back, it, we, it, we will not survive. Online oppression, for example. If you're a journalist and you write something, and if you write honestly, which I try and do, and I do, what comes back at you is so frightening, so intimidating, that the next time you write, you tone yourself down. And the time after that you write, you say to yourself, I really don't want another set of death threats and for the police to come here. And this, it is a kind of really a violence upon freedom coming from people who think they stand for free speech. Self-censorship and ambitions is another force we need to reckon with. How many journalists out there have abandoned, good journalists, some of them, ethical practice and the principles of uh, fairness and social value, which is what journalism is all about, which is why I wanted to be a journalist, which is why I only got to be one at the age of 37, thanks to his paper, actually. They were the first to publish me. But... It's gone. It's a valueless, it's becoming a valueless profession. Um, and talking about value seems very old-fashioned and uh, analog to a lot of people. Billionaires, we've had um, the very powerful statement. Facts and truths are now under attack like never before. Um, you might have seen the program about Mariana Spring, who is a young, feisty brilliant fact checker at the BBC who gets more abuse, online abuse than anyone else at the BBC. She's not a political journalist, she's not Laura Koonsberg who does also attract a lot of venom, partly because she's a woman, but a young journalist who's just checking facts for, the, for social media becomes the enemy. I don't know what we do about this. Um, Un and then there's the unseen punishments, and Peter must know these very well, but I too have become more and more aware of them. Uh, when I, the, the, you know, uh, the times that I've been writing and speaking about Palestine and Israel in particular, two subjects, Palestine and Israel, colonialism, the empire, and the West's uh, complicity in so many tragedies, post-colonial tragedies, like Iran, like Uganda, and so on. Suddenly, invitations are withdrawn from programs that have booked me a long time ago. Talks I was supposed to be giving, booked a year ago, even at book festivals. Suddenly, they don't want you anymore. And, and you don't want to be paranoid, and I don't want to be paranoid, but it's happening to a lot of us. It's not just happening to one, two, or three people. Then there's the, another kind of really awful pressure that uh, journalists of color and feminists go through, which is the tribalism problem. You're one of us. Don't criticize us. Don't you know there's a war going on? Don't you know, you know there's racism against us? Don't you know that, what's happening? So when I spoke about uh, lack, total lack of freedom of speech in Egypt and how a young man called Allah, a uh, nephew of a friend of mine, Adav Suef, has been in prison for five years. He's a blogger and human rights activist. Arundhati Roy uh, dedicated her, her pen prize to him. Um, I had all this, these, this oppression online saying, whose side are you on? You know, you know that what's happening in, in Palestine. Are you now siding with the, with the West? It was horrendous. So there are all these other issues that are coming into play. You have, and I, the, these are just very final points. I want to put them out for discussion. Um, the censorship and misrepresentation of anyone or anything which is left, center-left or left. 
Whatever you think of Jeremy Corbyn, he was a no-good leader. But he's not the evil man that our mainstream press has turned him into and uh, encouraged by the Labour Party. I find it astonishing that these things happened in Uganda when I was living there, that somebody would be picked up, a politician would be picked up, maligned, and then would disappear. And I think it is, you know, one has to remember how the right totally misrepresents those on the left, particularly properly on the left, and I am properly on the left. Sense, but then there's also the censorship of, by the centre-left and the left. So again, like the tribalism I talk, the community tribalism, how can you criticise our side? So after Labour won, and I was very critical of this, uh, you know, how Diane Abbott had been treated, all this rush comes out. Do you want the Tories back then? No, I don't want the Tories back. And I criticised uh, Starmer's love of spectacles bought by other people, uh, millionaires. And I was told, well, look at Boris Johnson. And I said, I didn't vote for the Labour Party to have somebody who was not as corrupt as, only a little corrupt. I didn't vote for that. We wanted clean politics. But what I'm saying is the role is now an embattled road, role, but a brilliant thing to be doing. I would not do anything else with my life. Um, well, I, I jotted down ten reasons to be gloomy and one reason to be cheerful. So. Um, <laughs> And some, some, some of it's already been covered. So I'll, I'll just rattle through these, these ten reasons to be gloomy. The, 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 the first is the, the legal threats that journalists face. And we've always faced legal threats, and I've got the scars on my back. Um, but it does feel as though the, 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 something has changed, uh, as if the protections available to journalists have uh, been weakened. Uh, and the money available to people who, uh, the powerful people who want to protect their reputations and to stifle stories, um, uh, it, it, the, the balance has gone. Um, and it's not just about um, slaps, which um, governments keep promising to do more about. Uh, I think it's just the fact that if you've got enough money, you can intimidate and uh, tie up publications endlessly uh, in, in defending work. Uh, and the particular targeting of, of individual journalists we saw with Carol Cadwallader um, is sort of separating them from their news organizations and, and trying to um, uh, just um, effectively almost bankrupt them, but certainly to silence them. And I, I think we have to accept that money can buy silence uh, today. The second... Um, I, I, I'll just touch lightly on because Peter and Yasmin have already dealt with so much, but this sense of impunity in killing journalists now, um, that, that feels new. I mean, jour journalists have been killed in the past, but not this sense that, that journalists are being um, deliberately killed, deliberately targeted, and that there are no consequences will flow. And as both Peter and Yasmin have said, that the, 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 there's no global outcry uh, that this this is happening. 134 Palestinian journalists killed in the last year, 71 imprisoned. Um, I mean, these are staggering figures, and um, and and just no sense of outrage. Uh, the third uh, reason is e even in more so-called democratic countries, uh, the clampdown on the reporting of national security. So the the work that we did at The Guardian on, on, on WikiLeaks and um, Edward Snowden, I think would be impossible now. Um, the, 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 the laws have been changed in the UK and Australia, certainly, uh, to make that kind of reporting, uh, uh, to criminalize that kind of reporting. So this, this powerful scrutiny that we were able to turn on the national security state, um, I think, I think, we won't see again. Um, uh, you, the, the, the treatment of, of Assange and, and, um, and, and Snowden, I think, was a deliberate attempt to, to deter any whistleblowers from coming forward and, and giving the media the kind of stories that we were able to work with. 
but also the, the changes in the UK law now. Um, so uh, anybody who did what I did as an editor would now go to jail for up to 14 years. Uh, and they've deliberately not allowed a public interest defense so that you can't, you can't say why, why you publish something, uh, which is very, very rare in law that you're not allowed to actually get in the witness box and, 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 and explain your actions. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, there, there is no public interest defense, so um, that's a bad thing. Uh, the fourth bad thing is the economic plight of, of news. Um, the, 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 uh, I mean, I won't labor the point because we, we understand what's happening with news and why it's happening, but it does mean that the institutional strength of news organizations has gone or is, is going. So that, that sense of the institute, if you took on the reporter, if you wanted to complain about a story, you, you, you faced the institutional weight who, of, of an organization who would stand behind the reporter uh, and stand behind the story. It's sort of slightly tied into the, the legal point at the beginning, but it's not just a legal point. Uh, and that's that's going, and you know I, I'm sure we all read individual reporters. This fragmentation of the media scene, uh, many 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 brilliant writers on Substack, but they're very isolated and vulnerable to attack. Uh, and so that uh, that institutional weight that has crumbled in the in the face of the economic plight of news is um, that's my fourth reason to be gloomy. Uh, we're nearly there, nearly halfway. Um, the, the, the fifth, uh, I, again, I won't labor because uh, it, uh, Peter certainly t talked about this, and the, it's the crisis of uh, ownership. Um, in th this week, the Washington Post, a paper, a paper that was known for its incredible courage, uh, has cravenly decided not to endorse uh, a presidential yeah. candidate. Yeah. The same thing happened at the LA Times. Um, around the world, there's a playbook now where where autocrats target uh, the media uh, by by um, putting in these oligarchs and these rich owners, getting their mates to buy up independent media. Um, Peter's mentioned the, um, the, the the fact that the Telegraph is now in play, and if you thought the Barclay brothers were bad, you, you wait to see what's coming uh, uh, down the slipway. <coughs> um, the, the, the extraordinary financing of, of GB News um, uh, by Paul Marshall uh, and um, the, the fate of the Observer I is in play. Um, the sixth reason it's been touched on tonight, the, the flood of disinformation that is um, going into the public square, um, which is a completely deliberate tactic. It, it's Stephen Baden's flood the zone with shit. Uh, if you flood the zone with shit, then people stop knowing what to believe or, or how to believe. They just feel overwhelmed by all this bad information. Uh, and it's a deliberate tactic. Uh, and you target, in the way that Trump does, the, the, um, the best information there is uh, and says that's fake news. Uh, and every survey now shows that people just don't know who to trust or what to believe, and that's a very frightening situation. Um, and and the, the fact that the fact-based media is, is, is really struggling, and that in the end makes countries, de democratic countries, I think, impossible to govern. I mean, if you think of the, the struggle that we're gonna have over climate change to get people to just agree on the facts before we agree on the action, uh, and the British press, um, I think, is really bad at, at tackling climate change or even even bringing themselves to agree that there is a factual basis for what's going on. The seventh problem, I think, is this division between um, elite media and low-information voters. Um, I remember attending a, a dinner here in London uh, to celebrate the New York Times, and the New York Times is one of the great newspapers, and of course, it's done very brilliantly with its paywall. Uh, and the, the dinner was kind of to celebrate that. Um, and I remember Dean Bacay, the African-American editor of the New York Times at the, the time, saying to me quietly at the end, he said, I, of course it's great, um, and the New York Times is doing great work. Um, but I worry what happens when you've got 3% of the population very well informed and 97% of the population 
shut out of that information and you look at the information that they are reading and then, and then you see the crisis that, that happens to, to a country like America. Uh, and that's, that's tied into the attempt to target public service broadcasting, the, the forms of broadcasting that are universally available. So um, the BBC, you would think from reading most of the right-wing press, was uh, one of the worst things, uh, one of the worst institutions in Britain as opposed to one of the best institutions in Britain. Again, this is a deliberate tactic. If you go back to the, uh, the 2004, I think it was, blog by Dominic Cummings uh, and his policy for media, uh, number one was discredit the BBC. Number one, um, because uh, it's too powerful, it, it's too it's too obstructive to everything else they wanted to do to have that kind of good information, clean information, universally available. So you discredit the BBC, and boy, have we seen that happening over the last 20 years. And actually, number two on his list was create a Fox News-style broadcasting channel in Britain. And we've seen that happen too. Um, so this this problem of a, a very well-informed elite. Uh, and then uh, the rest of us with um, l less information, poor, the, the low information voters. Um, number eight, um, we, we know that, 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 that news organizations have got a real problem with trust. Uh, Jeff Bezos in his very disingenuous letter as to why he um, wouldn't allow the, the, new, 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 the, the Washington Post to endorse someone, tried to dress it up as a thing about trust and uh, and uh, it's a particularly it's a particularly bad problem in Britain uh, that we never address so we're now about 15 points behind Germany in, in terms of pe people being willing to trust mainstream media and the British press has always had a kind of sort of mill wall um, supporters attitude to this the mill wall supporters have this chant nobody loves us and we don't care um, and it was always a, a sort of almost a badge of honour that if, if people hated they hated you as a journalist, then you were doing something right. Uh, and there's never been a, a serious conversation or a forum where that conversation can take place, uh, in which the British media would sit down and begin to wonder why uh, that the, there is this gulf in trust. And I think it's something to do with something very fundamental about the craft of journalism. We, we saw it during Brexit, that the, the, the fundamental craft of journalism really should have been to inform people on both sides about the arguments uh, on both sides, because this was a very consequential um, decision for the country. And that's not what most of the British press did. Most of the British press said, we're going to tell you how to vote. We'll give you one side, uh, and we're not going to equip you in that way. And it was a terrible failure of journalism and I think showed a sort of crisis of, 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 of the basic uh, craft of journalism that, that, that the British press behaved at that point at that time. Uh, nine, we're nearly there, don't worry, um, the, is the disengagement of the big tech companies. So we, we, we can see the, the huge power over our lives uh, and the opaque nature of these big tech companies. Uh, and for a while, they were engaged with, with journalism, and they, they funded it, and they spread it, and they amplified it, and they tried to work out good journalism from bad journalism, and now they've just turned their backs. They've, they've, they've bailed out, uh, and it's worse than that, because with the advent of AI, they're now trying to steal all the, all the such journalism as remains uh, without paying for it. Um, uh, and, uh, and we know that AI is going to be like the Wild West, uh, and I don't know what can be done to try and re-engage the tech companies, but um, the, these are now the, the most powerful uh, information companies in the world. Uh, and then, I mean, look at what Elon Musk is doing to Twitter. They don't care about the facts. They don't care about the truth. Um, uh, I mean, that's a wild uh, uh, exaggeration, but, but some of them don't. Um, and um, I, th I think we urgently had to work out how to re-engage them. And the final thing that I think is, is a reason not to feel cheerful is that there is no proper media literacy um, <coughs> in schools. Um, I, I do think it's really dangerous that the, the, the kids of 15, 16, once they become exposed to social media, uh, are so ill-equipped to work out what's true and what's not true and what is worth reading, what's not reading, or just to think critically about sources. 
when I was teaching in, in Oxford, I'd, um, th these very clever young students would come along and I'd, I'd say in week one, just bring something, bring a new story that's caught your eye. And they would bring along quite interesting stories. And I'd say, that's fascinating. Where, where did that come from? And nine times out of 10, they'd say Facebook or Instagram or Reddit. And I'd say, oh, that, that's fascinating. You know, Facebook doesn't have any reporters. And the sort of look of astonishment would sort of fall over there. And you'd say, so where did it come from before it was on Facebook? And it was kind of sort of a blinding revelation to some of them. And these, these were the cleverest ones. And I just don't think we're equipping young people to be able to think critically about where information is and, and where it's coming from. So that's 10 reasons to feel gloomy. Um, uh, I, I, I think the reason to feel cheerful is, despite everything that we've said tonight, um, there are great reporters around, there are great editors. Um, uh, I'm always amazed that anybody wants to be a journalist nowadays, but you go into journalism schools and there are people who know that it's crappily paid, that it's insecure, uh, and that it's dangerous, and uh, all the rest of it. And yet they want to do it. And I think it is a kind of sort of vacation. The people who want to do it are called to do it. Uh, and I think it's one of the most noble and necessary public services. Uh, and it's uh, tremendously encouraging to me that there are people of huge uh, courage uh, and, and, and determination to succeed. Uh, I, I chair the Reuters Institute in Oxford and we have journalists from all over the world uh, who come and do fellowships, and normally about 12 at a time. Uh, and when you see these journalists from Sudan and Pakistan, and India, um, Mexico, South America, uh, uh, and their incredible tenacity, Turkey, Russia, <coughs> and, and bravery, um, you have to feel a bit humble ab about the... the um, uh, just about the, 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 the resilience and stamina and determination of people who will risk their lives to, to do what journalism should be doing. So it's easy to get terribly depressed, and I've given you 10 reasons to feel terribly depressed, um, but I would like you to end the evening when, as you go out actually feeling a tiny bit cheerful because, uh, because there are people, amazing people, who are still doing amazing work. Thank you. I just wanted to add a, a thing when I said we are kind of eating ourselves internally. One of the, uh, you know, I love the BBC when it's good, but the, it, the BBC itself has been eaten up and it's destroying itself, its own principles. Because why otherwise would it choose to give a series to Michael Gove? on Radio 4, a prime slot, and publicize it. This man who lied through, to, you know, what Alan has said, the, the Brexit years, who brought the infection of comingism into government, who has done such damage even to his own best friends. Why would, and, and, and the Tories are not even in government now. So what makes the BBC think that it falls within its responsibility to give this man such space. What is this cowardice about? Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, before I open to the audience, <clears throat> there's a question which has come in from India from a former colleague and a student here at Sawas who is now a journalist with NDTV. NDTV was once upon a time uh, brilliant television news um, organization since then has been brought over by a prominent businessman in India. Uh, she writes, uh, and she says that, you know, in NDTV we still sign up to a code of ethics, and which says, this academic word which we use, objectivity, two sides to a story. Mm -hmm. And she says, in times where Gaza is happening in front of our eyes, Objectivity doesn't obviously work. Two sides to a story doesn't work. What can replace objectivity? Who, who decides what is fair? How will we be just? So yeah, this comes all the way from India. Open to all three of you. Well, it's a very good question. When, when we were 
you know, the apartheid was the great injustice at the time, one of the great injustices. I don't think anybody thought we should tell both sides of the story. Did they? They, 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 they you know, did they? Did they? Would they have the apartheid defender and a, a, a black resistance member on the Today program? I don't remember that. There were some. There are some situations and some issues where it becomes so necessary to be ethical and to and to choose sides. I don't think it happens a lot, but there are situations. The Bosnian War was another one. Yeah, I think. So uh, there are examples of where the two side things didn't happen in quite the way that journalists are taught they should. But should two sides be a no. cornerstone anymore uh, today in a world so by, so divisive? I don't think so. <laughs> but then, I don't know. These two are more experienced than me. So. Well, I, I, do, I rather agree. I think that on, you know, the BBC Panorama did a two sides thing on a year after um, the seven of October, you know, so, so probably over 100,000 Palestinians have been killed, but, and they did one, uh, and it's traumatized an Israeli family and then a traumatized Palestinian family. I, I'm not sure that's the right way, but what, I, what you've definitely got to be, and this is what I would focus, is on uh, being accurate and truthful, yeah. and fair, all of those. And that is, so to those sizes them is a, uh, is, a, is, a, is, I think, something one needs to think about. I, I think it slightly comes under my, what was it, um, point, point eight, the, 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 the lack of serious discussion about the craft of journalism. I mean, it, it, I, I think journalists, it, it's terribly interesting. If you go to an American journalism school, you'll be told that objectivity is all. If you go to a British journalism school, you'll be told that there's no such thing as objectivity. So you, you, you're, you're asking the innocent reader to say, look, we have this craft called journalism, which is our best way at arriving at, let's not call it the truth, because the truth's a big word, but facts. Um, and, and yet we can't agree as journalists whether the, the, on the basics of the craft. I mean, I, I'm slightly with Peter. I, 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 I prefer words like fairness. Um, uh, I think, you know, impartiality is a difficult word. Balance is a difficult word. Objectivity is a difficult word. I think fairness is a, is a good word, and, and facts, fact is a very good word. And I, 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 do, I wouldn't write, write off two sides, because often it, there are three sides or four sides, and, and, and you can't get at the facts or get near the truth without, without examining all the sides. Thank you, Alan. <coughs> I'm going to, uh, time's running short, I'm going to open the, for questions, uh, would you mind, Justin, uh, lady in the blue jumper? Hello. Thank you very much for an excellent panel uh, discussion. Uh, just to address this last point, it wasn't my, it's not my question, but the ICJ or UN uh, bodies are good ways of judging whether you should, what, whether the two sides argument. I mean, maybe journalists could take a leaf out of the book by reporting or taking the, the, the view that international bodies uh, dealing with law and th people like the ICJ and the ICC take. But really my question is about the war correspondent. I mean, you mentioned... Uh, uh, Marie Colvin, and, and, and the Western war correspondent I want to talk about, people like Martin Bell or Tim Page or, you know, uh, uh, Don McCullen. Where are they? Why aren't they in Lebanon reporting from the front line? We see the Al Jazeera journalists in Gaza, and the, the mantra has been, well, we're not allowed into Gaza. But they're in Lebanon, but they're sitting in their hotels. Why aren't we seeing them on the front line? I think that's rather unfair. I mean, what, I, I mean if you look at Lindsay Hilson, um, if you look at the BBC reporter, you know, when Israel, it was very interesting. Israel, as we know, comes up with one lie after another about what's going on underneath the hospitals. It produces these great fabricated sort of uh, 
skyscrapers, uh, underground skyscrapers full of weapons and sinister things. Uh, and actually, we, we learned to say that they did that Al Shifa, and it turned out not to be the case. But for the, I forget the name of the BBC reporter, which is quite a well known foreign correspondent. She, in Lebanon, they say the same stuff, and they produce those for piles of gold or something. And she went and had a look. <laughs> we could see that the ITF was talking nonsense. And so actually, the, it's very interesting, Lebanon. You've got journalists there, and they're showing us what's happening. And we could find out that the Israelis are talking nonsense. I'm not saying it's a, it's a, it's a very... Whereas in Gaza, we, there are no Western journalists, and, uh, uh, and they haven't. So I think you're being a bit unfair to the... Uh, I, I, um, I tell you what, going to a front line and getting shot at is not something I recommend. I, 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 um, I think it, I, uh, so photographer, well, they are in Lebanon reporting on the ground, and, and uh, generally speaking, it's a very s foolish journalist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could I have a mic there? Hi, um, thank you guys all very much as well for your introductions. Um, as you guys all sort of laid out, it's all quite doom and gloom and this is why we're here because journalism is under attack. But I think I'm not the only like young sort of aspiring j journalist in the room and you low-key depressed us and <laughs> I like I don't want to do journalism anymore. But I don't I know that's not the case and I know you guys want us to be journalists and want us to go into the industry. So what advice would you guys have, or would you, I want to say, what, what are the solutions to these problems that you guys laid out? But I'm sure we'd be here all day. So, just what advice? What do you think aspiring and the next generation of journalists should do to fix at least or try, you know, fix some of the problems that you guys outlined? Thank you. No, you go first. <laughs> um, well, uh, please do it. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, seriously. Um, uh, as I say, there there are dozens of reasons not to do it, and we've been quite gloomy tonight. Um, but but the world can't exist without. I mean, democracies can't exist without fact-based information. Somebody has to go out and find those facts. Somebody has to challenge power. Somebody has to do the most basic things, like this happened, this didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, this is true. That's not true. Because without that societies completely lose their bearings. Um, so please don't let us put you off tonight. <laughs> um, and come and have a chat afterwards and I'll give you some advice. But the, the other thing is, you, you know, your generation really understands this beast that I don't, social media. And maybe the transformation will come when honest, good, ethical journalists like you, young people, transform that space into proper journalism, into an ethical space. And it can be done. Mm -hmm. And in some parts of it, it is being done. Not, not enough. It's a new, it's relatively new space. And it's a wild west out there. But I think a combination of young brains and new technology could see another altogether unexpected flowering of good journalism. Well, it, it's happening already. I mean, it, 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 it sort of slightly ties into the last question. I mean, the, 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 there are extraordinary journalists like Motez Azaiza in, in Gaza, this is amazing photographer, yes. who ended up, before he left, with 17 million followers, 17 million followers. To one individual journalist, who, I, I thought he must be the most individual, individually uh, influential journalist in the world at the moment. So the, the barriers to entry are really low at the moment. It's, it's you know, easier. It was really difficult when Peter and I were starting out uh, to get a, anybody to read our copy at all <laughs> and, and try to get a job somewhere where we could, we, we could um, break into journalism. It, it's much easier to, 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 to get in uh, and to, uh, to find an audience uh, and to do important work. And, and also, you know, I talked about, for instance, climate change earlier. Um, I, th I can't believe the stupidity of news editors and editors. At the same time, I, I, again, it comes, comes back to the, 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 the question.
question of craft. We're asking people to have trust in us and to believe that we have a craft to tell them the truth, and yet we spout rubbish about climate change. Uh, and I think most young people wouldn't dream of reading most m mainstream uh, outlets on climate change. And if you're interested in climate change, what a great opportunity mm -hmm. to, to go out and tell the truth and treat, treat that subject with the seriousness it deserves uh, in a scientific way, because the mainstream media has just left that football pitch completely vacant to, to young people. Thank you very much. And just again, echoing the thanks. I think everyone's said already for that great introduction and words so far. Um, given the litany of challenges that you've all outlined, do you, um, what do you see the role of government in trying to change this? Initially in the UK, as that's where we're here, and we've got a new government. Um, do you see the role of breaking, trying to break up large monopolies, be that tech giants, the role of Hutton phase two, et cetera, et cetera? Do you think any, any of those things have got, a, have got a place? And if so, how? They rather, I did, well, they, it's a very important question. Uh, I mean, first of all, we have to end the, um, the way that Britain is currently governed. About 20, it was Tony Blair who started this, who decided that in order to end the government, he needed to form an alliance with Rupert Murdoch. Uh, and uh, and, and it's, it's poisonous not just for journalism, that, but it's also poisonous for our society because Murdoch doesn't have British interests. Uh, you know, he wants to create division. And we saw the, um, we saw the influence, that horrible deal, disgusting deal, done after The Guardian had done under Alan. I so admired this, what, what you and Nicholas Davis did was to expose the criminality of the Murdoch, of Murdoch, particularly the Murdoch operation, actually the whole of the press. Uh, but they got out, they, did, they struck a deal with the Cameron government, the, the Cameron government, not to go ahead with so-called Leveson 2. And Leveson 2 was important because, uh, because the trials were going on when Leveson 1 happened, and Leveson 2 was going to expose the links between big criminal gangs, the press, and government. I think that, that's more or less... Uh, and it had to happen, and it didn't. And that was the power of the Murdoch Empire to stop that happening, and the, and the press as a whole. And so the we, we must have a Leveson too, because the, the, what would emerge would be quite horrific. Uh, and I know quite a lot what, what would emerge. I won't know as much of what Alan knows about that. Um, uh, and I also agree with what you say. I think that the, um, these media monopolies have to be broken up. I mean, the Murdoch organisation is 35, 40% of newspaper readership. It's, it's far too much. More than that, I, I would say they have, to, they have to pay their British taxes. They have to be, I'm not saying they have to be, they have to be based in Britain and pay full taxes in Britain. This would be an extraordinary moment. I mean, Lord Rothermere, does he not live in France or something? Yeah. Um, and uh, Murdoch, I don't, is he American? He's never been a British citizen, and I think for about 10 years he never paid any tax at all. Now, you, if you're going to be, to, and this would bring us back to the situation where these, these newspapers and, or, and media owners, they aren't very like GMTV, isn't it? The owner in Dubai or something, does he? I mean, I, I, <laughs> and, and I think that they represent an olive, they have come to represent in the way they didn't, an oligarchical class, which does not actually have any, doesn't live in this country, doesn't depend on the NHS or decent roads, but are basically... I can go on about it. you get so I do think we need we I, we need to change the whole system whereby you have to be British and you have to pay full British taxes which are announced and available for inspection so we can see that you're not ripping it you know because they don't represent us at all. I did read I did read Leveson too. I don't think yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I just add that um, Rachel Reeves is one of the statements she did make and I don't know what it actually means is that they're going to get rid of the non-DOM status, which would be pretty brilliant if they did it. But I bet you they won't, because actually the politics of cowardice plays out phenomenally in this, this, this Labour Party. And the other thing is that knowing what we know about the Murdoch press, for example, or the Telegraph, how it misrepresents 
I mean, he, it's lied and lied and lied about migrants on the boats. It's lied about asylum seekers. It's lied about... And yet you find the Labour front benches constantly penning comment pieces for those very papers. Um, and so I'm not that hopeful, but the non-DOM news could be very good. I, I would just add three things. The first is to... Uh, complete, you've got a once-in-a-lifetime chance, I think, to free the BBC from any kind of government regulation. And the, the sight of Boris Johnson trying to put Charles Moore into the BBC and Paul Dacre into Ofcom uh, made you realise that, that these institutions need to be set up again to be completely... Um, and I don't know if Lisa Nandy is going to look at these proposals to, to mutualise the BBC, to give everybody a share in the BBC, but, but I think <coughs> you've got about five years to... to to the, put the BBC onto a, a proper independent footing. Same applies for regulation. They've, they've got Michael Grade in at, at um, Ofcom, uh, and we know that Robbie Gibb, when he was the director of the BBC, was trying to sort out who should be the director of the regulator of the BBC. I mean, it was just a shambles of, uh, of corruption, really. Uh, and uh, and the, the Ofcom has been pathetic in dealing with GB News and. and uh, so you've got to have a proper proper regulatory framework. Uh, and the final thing is this, the, the, the question of tech and the, these big tech companies and how you deal with them. I did a, a conversation with a, a, an advert for our podcast, Media Confidential, which I do with Lionel, uh, Lionel Barber. And we had Tim Snyder on the other day, the, the, the American academic, who, who was just saying that the, on the polluter pay, pay, pays principle, uh, so if you're someone like Elon Musk and you are actively polluting the, the, the stream of information, they, they should pay a, 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 a form of tax to, uh, to pay for clean information because we can't live without clean information. So you know, I think there are, there are some things that the, the, the Labour government could do quite easily. Thank you. Can I take a question at the back? Uh, While you're going to the back, I'll just give you an example from today about how the Murdoch press runs this country. If you look at the budget, it knocks up bus prices to three pounds, yeah. and then they they didn't put off they wouldn't didn't raise fuel prices because that's the sum campaign is not to yeah. raise fuel prices. So the rich people can go around driving around like and climate your climate change point, whereas poor people got whacked. That's clearly a direct effect of Sun Daily, the Sun newspaper's campaign. Thank you. I wanted to ask, we definitely still have, despite it all, great journalists, and apparently we have good, expiring uh, young journalists. What I'm curious to hear is your opinion on how we as a citizen can support them in this mess. What can we do to support them, given what they're going through? I'm not sure we... Yeah, what, what, has, what has citizens we can do? Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, one I mean, pay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> really, pay for news. Uh, I mean, I, I, I pay for w Wikipedia because I think Wikipedia is a rather wonderful thing. And, and every, you know, every six months they pop up a reminder and I pay. And I pay for The Guardian. Uh, and The Guardian is trying to do this extraordinary thing of, of trying to, to be a source of information to, to everybody. So it's not a private good, it's a public good for everybody because I think good information has to be a public good. So I would just say choo choose, or, or it could be a journalist on Substack, I would just choose the, the two or three organizations or journalists who you think are decent, full of integrity and providing information that society needs and give them a bit of money occasionally. Yeah, uh, can I have the gentleman here right next to you? Uh, thank you. Um, I suppose my question is a brief one. It seems like the common theme is uh, a lack of accountability in the press and by the government. Um, my question is, I suppose, I remember uh, when it came to Afghanistan, there were major cities like Herat, Jalalabad, second biggest city in Afghanistan, collapsing. Um, people were in denial, people all around me, even in the press. 
Um, so I suppose my question is, to what degree this attack on journalism is, uh, is it connected with a denial um, with things going on and, and, and being removed from reality? Yes. I think that's a really important question. And it's something we haven't mentioned is that in a cultures, in all the cultures, it seems to me, around the world, except possibly for places like Afghanistan, which is just, I can't even imagine what Afghanistan it feels like now. There's been this move towards entertainment, absolutely obsessing and occupying people. It's, it's junk food for the brain that has deliberately been used, I think, to misinform or underinform people. So, I, you know, my students, my journalism students, when we started this year, and they were my first first year students, they'd not seen any news for, you know, they could talk about Love Island, they could talk about Celebrity Master Chef. I could talk about all that, but it was like, we are distracted all the time. And who does that serve? And the people making money out of them. I, on the, bri briefly on the answer to your question, of course, if you look back at the history of journalism, the coverage of the, you know, the uh, Vietnam War, the what happened later, or later on in Cambodia, the monstrous bombing campaigns by the US, the, the assassinate, the U United States foreign policy in Guatemala, Nicaragua, et cetera. All of the, none of this was reported at all. We had a much more healthier press. It was just, generally speaking, particularly US journalism, was a manifestation of the US foreign policy. So uh, we mustn't be too, um, <laughs> too convinced about <laughs> about, uh, about uh, uh, and indeed the reporting of what's going on in Gaza now is just simply a continuation of the way that foreign correspondents reported every American foreign war, which effectively this is, uh, going back to the, you know, to 1945 when they became an imperial power. It's only the funding. It's only a bit left wing there, I think. <laughs> 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 Alan, would you want to add something? Yeah. All right. I, I have time for one last question. Should we? Yeah, this guy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi. <coughs> Thank you very much for a really interesting uh, discussion so far. A quick question: When we've got people like Musk, platforms like X, actively encouraging the rejection of traditional journalism, the pillars of what journalism stands for. How do traditional legacy media organizations stand up to that? Is it by continuing to report, continuing to be honest? Are there conversations that need to be had outside of journalism? So I guess my question is when we've got that encouragement by Musk, for example, and, and polluting that information ecosystem, particularly online, how do traditional, perhaps legacy media organizations respond to that? to regain or gain the trust of people that are being brought up in this day and age to unfortunately reject what journalism stands for? My answer would be Brazil. See what Brazil's done. They've banned him. And he's lost the case. And he's given up. And the EU is processing a, a set of responses to the other big tech companies. But of course, we are not in the EU. I do agree uh, that we, I mean, it, it is the, in the 1890s, wasn't it, the, the United States, was it Roosevelt, took on the big, uh, the big corporations, the big manufacturers, these overmighty uh, organizations, and I have a feeling we need to do the same. I, I mean, Facebook is a nightmare. I mean, it just, it, it has a model which enables it, to, which, to make money out of hate speech, um, uh, and that is very dangerous in places like India, and particularly. And um, I, I'd like to see them broken up. I don't know how that would be done, but I'm sure there are interesting ways in breaking up and fighting back on behalf of decency and democracy against these nightmare groups as they become. Uh, um, and, uh, but Facebook is, I think, more serious than Musk, actually. <coughs> Look, I've completely run out of time, really. I've if there are pertinent questions, do 
talk to the panelists after, but now I have to, uh, I have been told that I have to shut down at 8.30. Graham Earl, Professor Graham Earl, may I invite you please to give the vote of thanks. Hello, is this thing on? Yes. Goodness, um, I printed a page of um, things to say, and now what I have is a scrawl of, of blue um, over this. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Graham Earl. I'm the Dean of the, the College of Humanities. It's the place where the MA um, that, that we're co-creating and launching today and the partnership with the Institute will be, will be based. Um, and, and I am filled still with optimism um, with that endeavour. Um, but yeah, that was, um, I think, a fabulous, a fabulous panel. Um, as Som said, um, my job is to say, is to pass on um, the thanks. Um, as well as sometimes, I guess, being um, a little bit gloomy about uh, the, the press and, and the future, sometimes we're, we're quite gloomy about universities. But, but when I talk about universities, um, hopefully this won't be trite, um, this is what I talk about. So it's having, you know, we have difficult conversations, we, we are critical, we bring people together who have different views, we hear them, um, and we're passionate about things that really matter. And I think what this last hour and a half demonstrated is, is that that's what this is about, um, that's, what, that's what universities are about, and that's why I'm proud to be at one. Um, and, and I think that they're all the same, they're all driven by the same things, despite how they're sometimes, um, they're sometimes described. Um, I wrote down a few things um, about what I think I took from the panellists and, and the things that they were saying. Um, uh, crucially, they celebrated the heroism of journalists, and that is something we should thank them for and that we should thank um, journalists for. They shone a light on things, I think, very, very brightly. They shared a really palpable disgust, which I think is perfectly suited to the topic, and, uh, and sharing that disgust is something that perhaps we all need to do a bit, a bit more. Um, they were analytical. And that's, I quite like that, being a, a professor at a university as well. But, of course, that's not the only place where people are analytical and a place where they have deep knowledge and, and, and deploy that knowledge. I like the use of craft constantly. Um, uh, again, another thing that we don't often tend to celebrate um, craft, as Adam said, practice, time spent learning how to do these things. And as I say, also the kind of the fundamentally, um, the point of, um, the ending point of optimism. So, so can I please just, let's say thank you very much to the panellists for all of those things and more. The last thing but you're welcome to go. Last thing I do is I have to thank some of the people who've been involved who've enabled this to happen. Um, I have to thank um, Justin and Somnath and all of the teams that they, they brought together and all the people that made this possible um, today. Um, we have loads of colleagues who do fascinating research and teaching on, on this subject, and they will be brought um, into this endeavour. We also have extraordinary partners, practitioners, who will be brought together in this. And, uh, and I'm extremely optimistic at the end of this conversation about all the things, not least from a number of people who express that this is the direction of travel they want to go in, despite knowing um, all the horrors that they'll encounter on the way. So thank you all very much for coming, and, uh, and safe journeys home.